But I wanted to mention another indicator, neither environmental nor economic, which I think is going to tell us more about our future than any other trend. And that is the number of failing states in the world. About a year ago, it suddenly hit me as I was looking at the failing states issue, that failing states are an early sign of a failing civilization. This is how you would expect to happen, it to happen. The weaker states would begin to fail first. The list of failing states is getting longer each year. And now suddenly we have three major new sources of stress, in addition to the traditional ones, many of them driven by population growth. Um, the ones I mentioned earlier, soil erosion, deforestation, falling water tables, etc. We're now looking at the fallout from climate change, whether that's record heat waves or, or um, more destructive storms of the sort that, that, that hit the Irrawaddy River Delta in, in, in Burma, now called Myanmar, um, just a few days ago. Enormous destruction and loss of life, now estimated to be maybe 100,000. Um, but we're going to see more and more of these developments um, in the years ahead. A second stress is peak oil. We don't know exactly when peak oil will come. Some geologists think it may have been last year. Others think it's still a few years down the road. But either way, um, it's going to come soon. And I don't think we're, we're going to see much increase in oil production beyond the current levels. Once we're past peak oil, we'll be living in a very different world because in a post-peak oil world, no country gets more oil unless another gets less. Throughout our lifetimes, world oil production has been increasing, increasing, increasing. Everyone could have more oil. That's not going to be true for much longer, and I don't think the world is prepared for it. The third new stress, beyond the fallout from climate change and the post peak oil problems, is the problem of rising food prices. We had grain price surges in the last half of the last century. Probably the best known was 1972 when the Soviets had a poor harvest, didn't tell the world about it, quietly cornered the world wheat market. They bought up most of the world's exportable supplies of wheat for themselves, and it created panic in world markets. Wheat rice, corn prices doubled, or in some cases even tripled. There were other price surges, none quite as dramatic as that during the latter part of the last century, but they were always event driven. If it wasn't a poor harvest in the Soviet Union, it was a monsoon failure in India or record heat and, and drought in the U.S. corn. What we're now experiencing is trend driven. It's driven by three trends on the demand side. One, the addition of 70 million people per year. You do not have to be an agronomist to see that if you keep adding 70 million people per year, eventually you're going to be in trouble. Or look at the number of people in the world today, probably close to 4 billion, who want to move up the food chain, consuming more grain-intensive livestock products. An enormous additional growth in the demand for grain. But the straw that's breaking the camel's back is a massive diversion of U.S. grain to the production of ethanol fuel for cars. Enormous. We used to have a food economy and an energy economy, and they were more or less separate. Now they're beginning to fuse because we have the technology to convert grain into oil, grain into ethanol, actually. And what happens in this new situation is that if the food value of a commodity is less than the fuel value, the market will move that commodity into the energy economy. This means that the price of grain 
is now key to the price of oil. Because we can convert grain into oil, in fact. As the price of oil went from $60 a barrel to $100 a barrel, the price of grain followed it up. If oil goes to $140 a barrel, the price of grain will follow it up. What we've done is set the stage for direct competition between the 860 million of us who own automobiles and want to maintain our mobility and the two billion poorest people in the world who simply want to get enough food to survive. Competing, these two groups competing for the same world grain supplies. We've never faced an economic, political, or moral issue like this one. And unfortunately, no one is in charge. No one is mediating the competition between the 860 million people who own cars and whose average income is about $30,000 a year who are competing with the two billion poorest people whose incomes average less than $3,000 a year. We've never faced a problem like this before.